Welcome to Social Studies 2201. This is Unit 4, Economic Change. Outcome 10, Pre-Modern Economic Change. So in this outcome, we have two delineations. The first topic we'll look at today is 10.1, Explain Economic Innovation from the Paleolithic Era to the Ancient Era. So this is the earliest economic innovations that humans developed. After this, we'll look at 10.2, explain economic innovations from the pre-modern and early modern era, so much more recent. So before we discuss economic innovation, we have to take a look at what economics is and why it's important in the first place. Uh, many of the innovations that we've looked at in this course already and the ones that we will look at going forward relate to economics. And economics is a study of how to maximize use of resources to meet needs and wants. Um, and so the difference between needs and wants, fairly straightforward, but a need is anything required for your survival. So food, clothing, shelter, and so on. Uh, a want is different in that it's not required, but uh, it makes your quality of life better uh, or makes your life more comfortable. Uh, so, for example, cell phone, internet, uh, vehicles, uh, many, many, many other things. So, when we look at uh, the wants that humans have, as you can see over here in this visual, um, the Earth has limited resources. Okay, the Earth occupies physical space, so there will be a limit to it. Uh, but throughout history, we've seen that human wants continue to uh, increase. As you can see in the seesaw example, uh, the seemingly unlimited wants of humans may outweigh the limited resources of the planet. So what that is getting at is the idea of scarcity. And scarcity is... Um, the fact that resources are finite or limited, right? Something that's scarce is hard to come by uh, or is fairly rare. Uh, and it's for this reason that we have to be smart about the decisions we make about the resources that we have. You want to meet people's needs and wants, uh, and you want to be as efficient as possible in doing so, so that the resources you do have will go further. And that's the key idea, really, to um, economics and where we're going in this um, in this unit. So the idea of scarcity and meeting our needs and wants uh, is addressed through new innovations and in trade. And that's what we'll focus on now going forward. So if we go back to earliest human history and we look at the Paleolithic period, this is the period where Humans lived in small uh, kinship bands, um, communities, mostly of extended family uh, that could be range anywhere in size from 20 members up to 50 or 70. Um, they, these groups would uh, hunt and gather. That was their main lifestyle. And they would hunt and gather uh, food and other required items for survival. So the key point to take a look at there would be uh, the satisfaction of needs as opposed to wants. And in order to do that, these peoples developed many, what we would consider today primitive tools, uh, knives, spears, bows and arrows, and so on. Uh, and each one of these items were meant to increase the efficiency of uh, food gathering, whether it was... Um, uh, spears to help uh, hunt animals at a distance, uh, or whether it was uh, containers to hold more uh, berries or fruit that uh, these people would gather and so on. Uh, in addition, we get creating uh, or mastery of fire uh, to cook food, aid in digestion, uh, make food safer, but also to serve uh, as a source of warmth in the cold uh, and, and general safety. Uh, so creating or mastery of fire was uh, another important innovation of the Paleolithic period, as was spoken language. Uh, language 
is important here because it allowed these groups to coordinate their activities much, much easier um, when it could be uh, a large hunt uh, and you had a number of people with different tasks uh, within that hunt and um, communication would make it easier to coordinate how that uh, activity would uh, be conducted. So if we ask the question, how did these innovations make it easier for hominids to meet their needs and transform their way of life? The key idea is that with each new um, innovation, tool, uh, technology, the development of greater efficiencies and effectiveness in resource gathering was achieved. Okay, so um, these groups could be more successful, survive easier due to more food, uh, better protection, and so on, which would eventually lead to an increase in population as well. So these are the main economic activities uh, that we'll focus, focus on for the Paleolithic period. When we move ahead into the Neolithic period, beginning 10 to 12,000 years ago, um, the biggest single change in activity here is development of um, farming. Okay, farming is key um, because it dramatically affected the food supply uh, that these people would uh, have access to. Um, so not only would farming allow you to uh, increase your food supply, it would completely change the um, nature of your economy. So um, before this, in the Paleolithic period, many of these uh, groups would, as we said before, gather uh, food and resources. Um, and at that type of lifestyle, you would uh, you're more or less at mercy at the mercy of nature. So if the food uh, and other resources are available naturally and you're easy to get at, then you would probably um, be more successful. But at times when there's drought, um, flooding, any number of natural conditions that could have a negative effect, then you are also at the mercy of um, nature in that way. So your food supply could become very uh, irregular or hard to predict. So the big thing with farming here is that uh, people shifted to a food producing uh, lifestyle instead of gathering. So they had more control over uh, the food supply that they did make use of. Uh, at the same time, they continued to refine lithic tools, make them better. Um, and the development of metalworking would be important as well because we have new materials that you can make tools and weapons out of. Uh, early on, it would be uh, bronze. And later on, we'd get into the uh, uh, use of iron. Uh, but these are additional innovations that uh, allowed for greater effectiveness um, in their purpose. So uh, as we know, farming also meant that people settled down to live in particular areas. And that's key because that's going to mean now that instead of um, people following, for example, herds of animals over many, many, many miles, people will settle down and establish communities. Uh, these communities would first um, have small populations and be towns, but eventually the more successful ones would develop into cities with thousands and thousands of people. Uh, and this is where we get the development of civilization, right, as a result of uh, farming developments. Okay, so these greater populations required more food more tools, building supplies to construct um, buildings and other things that people needed. But also we see luxury items becoming important. Uh, these are items like silk, jewelry and spices and so on that uh, for the most part satisfy wants instead of needs. Uh, but because we have so many people in these cities uh, and we have um, a higher productivity of food production, over time, 
uh, people would uh, start to specialize in other jobs. Maybe you don't need uh, your entire population focusing on supplying food now. Maybe farming allows you to produce more food than you need. You have a surplus. Uh, some people don't have to farm anymore. Uh, and so that would lead to other types of jobs um, around tool making, uh, construction and building, and luxury items like, we, uh, like we've already mentioned. And what we note here as well is that it's in the Neolithic period that trade starts to uh, become more required in order to meet needs and wants. We'll take a look at uh, how that changes as we move into the ancient period. When we talk about trade, we should look at a couple of uh, key terms or points that go along with it. Trade itself is the exchange of goods and services. Um, whether it's uh, providing one item to another person in exchange for that or uh, doing something for someone else. Um, it's an exchange between people and groups. And this is a way of uh, gaining a greater amount of um, items that you might not have had previously, which will directly affect your uh, quality of life as you uh, meet your needs easier and therefore um, try to improve your life through wants. So how can trade help a group of people prosper? One group sells extra or surplus goods. We already mentioned surplus in, uh, in terms of uh, farming, for example. Uh, but once you have a surplus of goods, you have more than what you need. You have extra. So you're efficient enough at producing uh, these goods that you make more than what you need. So therefore, that extra, you have an option. You can either take that uh, extra supply of goods that you've, you've made and you can uh, store them for later use, or you can take the extra and trade them with, uh, trade it with other people in groups to acquire other things that uh, you need or want that perhaps you can't make. Okay, and so this becomes a key idea uh, for uh, trade as we go from the Neolithic into the ancient era. We also get um, a couple of ways that trade occurs. We get importing and exporting. Uh, so importing is basically bringing goods in from an outside source. Um, and uh, exporting is selling or providing goods to an outside source. So it's just uh, some more terminology that goes around with the, uh, the idea of uh, exchange. So if we move into the ancient period and we look at ancient uh, economic innovations, um, we note that uh, in the early uh, period, both in the Neolithic and eventually uh, in the early ancient period, uh, most civilizations were able to meet their needs by trading locally. So this might be from one city to another, um, both for acquiring needs and wants or satisfying needs and wants. Um, but you might find that uh, that limits the, the range of goods and services that you can have access to. If you expand your uh, uh, the region with, that you're trading within, you can uh, extend your trade connections and therefore have access to other goods that uh, are perhaps a bit more foreign. And this becomes uh, a common thing in the ancient uh, the ancient era, especially the uh, the early ancient era. So there's evidence to suggest that civilizations of Sumer, first civilization uh, on the planet, uh, traded textiles and food in exchange for things like copper, lumber, precious stones, cotton, and luxury goods from the Indus River Valley. Uh, we'll touch on this again shortly. Uh, but the growth of trade is linked to the desire for luxury goods. This is a, a key point that we see happening in the ancient period. Um, more or less, people can satisfy uh, their needs locally, as we mentioned earlier. Um, by now, most city-states are able to produce the food they require, the tools they need, 
building supplies, uh, and, and many other aspects of uh, um, uh, daily life. Uh, it's But uh, once those needs are taken care of, as we said before, there's a desire to satisfy uh, wants. And no one city or location will be able to produce um, all varieties of goods. Uh, so, for example, uh, a foreign city-state might be able to produce uh, fancy jewelry that is uh, desired and sought after with minerals uh, that they have available, uh, but another city-state doesn't have those resources available. So in order to uh, acquire those, that's an example of luxury good, uh, the, uh, we get the extension of uh, trade connections between uh, city-states at a further distances from each other. So as large towns appeared throughout Mesopotamia and Egypt during the Neolithic period, self-sufficiency started to fade as marketplaces appeared. So there came to be more places where you could buy and sell things or trade or exchange things. Um, these various city-states that we've um, made general reference to would each serve as marketplaces. They'd have their own goods that they could sell, but um, other uh, merchants or people from other regions uh, might travel there in order to sell their goods and acquire new ones. Cities started to work uh, very similar to this. They realized uh, that they could acquire goods they didn't have uh, at hand from other cities far away, um, where climate and natural resources produced a variety of um, other things um, that would link back to the idea of luxury goods. So this long-distance trade was slow and often dangerous, but was lucrative uh, for the middlemen willing to make the journey. So luxury goods would be quite valuable because, uh, especially if they came from uh, distances far away, uh, they would be uh, rare, harder to get access to. Um, but certainly through trade, you could uh, uh, develop wealth through uh, selling these items or, or exchanging them. Um, and... Because we're talking long distance of, distances of trade, uh, there's going to be risk associated with that, right? Whether it's uh, trade by sea, where storms uh, and pirates might be a risk, or uh, um, trade by land, where um, uh, brigands or thieves uh, might threaten your, um, your, your uh, trade. Uh, these things were dangerous, but the fact that these ancient cities uh, continued to develop these trade connections showed that it, it was the benefits outweighed the negatives. It was a profitable activity uh, that they wanted to do more and more of to acquire these goods and uh, improve their lives. So if we look at long distance trade and a specific, uh, start looking at some examples, um, the first long distance trade we believe originated over here in Sumer. Okay. Uh, and uh, connected to the Indus uh, River Valley. Okay. So, um, and as you can see, if we look at our scale here, uh, that's going to be uh, thousands of kilometers of travel. Okay. Um, so the long distance trade was limited almost exclusively to these luxury goods that we talked about, things like spices, silks, and so on. Um, and again, they're not required for survival, but uh, they make life easier, more comfortable, um, and so on. And we can see on this map as well that there might be a couple of different ways um, to trade here. The red arrows show sea-based trade, okay, through the Persian Gulf into the Arabian Sea. Uh, but we also get uh, potential land-based trade. Uh, so in areas where terrain 
allowed for easy transportation, uh, we might have uh, land-based trade occurring. So an example of uh, land-based trade uh, would certainly be the Silk Road, which is uh, probably the most famous uh, long-distance trade route uh, from antiquity. Uh, it connected uh, civilizations in the eastern Mediterranean, in this area, uh, with the Middle East, uh, Arabia, Persia, with India and into China and uh, Eastern Asia. Uh, and again, luxury goods were the key focus along this trade route. Uh, merchants would trade goods at different points along the route. So a merchant um, from, uh, let's say, Byzantium here might travel uh, part of the way along this route uh, and not really uh, travel the entire length. The reason that's possible is because that merchant might uh, bring goods uh, that they're selling partway along the trade route, while merchants from the other side of the trade route have already traveled so far this way. Uh, and so the goods from the east uh, will be available to those people from the west at middle points along the route. Uh, and so these cities served as key points uh, in uh, developing these uh, trade routes. Sea-based trade was uh, somewhat similar, um, very common in the Mediterranean area, uh, connected uh, eastern, the eastern Mediterranean to the west and other parts of Europe. Um, and as we can see in our map here, this is um, a map that shows the trade routes of the Phoenicians, uh, who we, we've looked at in an earlier unit. Um, and we know that the Phoenicians did a lot to spread civilization, but they established colonies uh, and through their um, innovations in, in sea travel and boat design, um, they were able to extend the distances they traveled by sea, uh, which would allow them to uh, trade with people from uh, very far away at times. Uh, and again, this is through uh, seeking luxury goods and acquiring those and the wealth that uh, might come with it. So another major economic innovation in the ancient period would be money. Okay, so before uh, the development of money, uh, trade was very much based on a barter system. What we mean by barter is that one good is exchanged for another good. So, for example, um, weapons or tools being exchanged for armor or clothing. Okay, so it's a direct exchange of items. Um, a problem with this system is that uh, you could only trade what you had. And um, if you had no items that other people wanted, then you couldn't trade with those people. They didn't want what you had, so you couldn't get access to what they had. Um, so it limited economic transactions and economic activity. Money is uh, comes along and makes a massive change to this. Okay, Money is any item that is recognized as having uh, value and can be used as a universal item of exchange. Okay, so um, this would allow you to, um, to trade with a greater number of people. So um, one merchant might uh, want access to livestock, uh, and, uh, but might not have the goods uh, that the other merchant would be looking for. But with money, everyone has uh, a desire or, or use for it because it can be exchanged for anything. So uh, even if one merchant didn't have the goods that another one wanted, as long as they had money, they could exchange money for uh, other goods. So this would increase 
transactions, increase economic activity greatly, uh, and it would improve the opportunities for trade. Early examples of money include livestock. This is some of the earliest types of money, um, cows and sheep, for example. These would have, uh, would have been uh, useful to everyone um, in, in earlier history as a food supply. Uh, but over time, other items would start to be used, like uh, cowrie shells, uh, and eventually paper uh, and coins. And uh, coins and paper are what we're perhaps more used to today. But coins would be of uh, crucial importance. Okay, that would be widely used for much of the uh, ancient and into the, the medieval period. So there are two types of money uh, that exists. You can have commodity money. Uh, and what this is, it's uh, an item that is used as money, but it has its own value due to uh, rarity. So, for example, gold and silver. Okay, those minerals are hard to come by. Uh, so, uh, they have value due to their rarity. Uh, but they, you can uh, create coins, for example, from gold and silver and so on, and can they can be physically exchanged as money, as a universal uh, item of exchange. The other type of money you can have is representative money. And this is uh, these are items that don't really have great value uh, in themselves. Uh, for example, paper uh, and so on, but um, they represent a value that's greater. So, for example, paper might not have a lot of value, but a paper check can be cashed, and that check represents a certain amount of uh, currency or wealth. Okay, so that would be representative money. A big uh, advantage for merchants with the use of money uh, would be the fact that money is lighter and takes up less space when traveling. So a merchant could uh, bring money with them on a trade expedition, um, and that takes up a lot less space than uh, having to have multiple wagons and carts um, to carry livestock and larger items. Okay, so already we can see that uh, the barter system uh, was uh, less efficient and less effective when it came to trade than what the exchange of money and currency would be, just for that reason alone. Um, so by having money, it would increase trading potential that uh, merchants would have. Final point about money, um, coins uh, became the standard uh, form of currency in the ancient era. Uh, and here in this picture, we've got an example of some Roman coins um, produced from gold and silver. Uh, and uh, they illustrate another use of money. Uh, you'll see here uh, that all of these coins have the likeness of someone on them or uh, someone's face uh, or picture. Uh, this one right here has the uh, the picture of the Emperor Hadrian, um, the Roman Emperor. Uh, but the point here is that um, coinage would be in high circulation. It would be exchanged around uh, countries and between countries. So what that would mean is that coins would travel long distances. And what um, wealthy people and emperors and rulers would do they would mint coins or produce coins uh, of different denominations and values. And they would often have their picture uh, put on the coin and maybe a, a message, uh, something that uh, they want other people to know them for. Uh, and this would serve as a type of propaganda. Uh, in the ancient world, uh, especially if we look at the Roman Empire, for example, it was a very, very large uh, territory. And the vast majority of people in the Roman Empire would never meet or see a Roman emperor in person, in face, face to face. Uh, so this would allow some kind of additional connection between the emperor and the everyday citizen. Uh, and any message put on 
uh, these coins uh, would uh, provide some type of um, impression that uh, those other people would have of uh, the emperor. Uh, so it was used as a type of propaganda as well. So this brings us uh, to the idea of a trade network. Uh, and in one way or another, we've looked at elements of this already uh, as, as we've been going through these notes. Uh, trade networks have five components, and we can briefly take a look at each one here. Trading partners would be vital. In order to trade, you have to have other people to trade with. right? So some merchants can grow rich selling desired goods um, to, to others and acquiring goods from others. Um, and the more trade partners available, the higher the potential for trade and exchange of goods. Uh, and so to be a trade partner, this type of economic uh, activity, this trade would have to occur regularly. Right. So we don't usually mean a one-off a trading expedition. We mean repeated regular uh, trade between two groups. Trade goods, of course, are, are vital if you're going to conduct any trade. Uh, if you're going to trade with someone, you have to have something to trade with. Um, and so you trade goods that uh, you have in abundance that uh, another person or group lacks. Okay, uh, and that's the idea of surplus uh, to help develop profit that we've uh, we've already mentioned. Um, trade goods could be pretty much anything you can imagine. Uh, they might be valuable because they're rare uh, or hard to come by. Uh, they could be useful to people. Uh, for example, salt was used to preserve meat. Um, the ancient period was long, long before the development of refrigeration. Um, or goods could be beautiful or sought after for their aesthetic value. Um, and silk and jewelry would be examples of that. Modes of transport would be important as well. If you're going to trade, especially over a long distance, you need um, vehicles or some way of getting from one place to another. Uh, for land-based trade, caravans was quite common. So this would be a series of camels, mules, or animals that would carry wagons and carts overland. Um, and those carts would carry the goods that uh, merchants traded. Um, vessels or, or boats and ships and so on would uh, rely usually on wind power uh, with the sail, um, but also in the ancient era, it was quite common to, uh, to use manpower through rowing. Uh, but anyway, these were uh, the main modes of transportation in the ancient, uh, in the ancient era contributing to uh, trade networks. We just talked about currency a few moments ago. Um, so currency, as we said, uh, would allow merchants to have a greater opportunity to trade with others. They can buy a greater variety of goods from a greater number of other people and merchants, uh, which would help build wealth. Uh, and of course, this would lead to the idea that the more money you have, the more potential buying power you have, uh, and therefore um, uh, your, your economic opportunity uh, is going to be much, much higher. Um, okay, and, so, and we already mentioned a couple varieties of uh, early types of money, salt, cowrie shells, precious metals, and so on. Uh, finally, middlemen. Uh, were very important. We touched on those earlier. Um, but middlemen were merchants uh, along trade routes at, at various points. Uh, they served as go-betweens, essentially, uh, so that, let's say you had a merchant at point A, wanted to trade for goods at point C. Uh, but maybe that merchant at point A now doesn't have to go all the way to point C. Maybe they only have to go to point B in between the two uh, to acquire what they want because maybe there's a merchant at point B who's already traded for those goods uh, with point C. So middlemen shorten the distances that merchants have to travel, which will then speed up 
um, uh, transactions and, and uh, trade expeditions and so on. So there are a couple of consequences of trade networks that we'll take a look at here briefly. Um, and we'll look at these in terms of uh, new cities that developed along these trade routes. Um, so these cities were often uh, quite rich as a result of their location. Uh, some were in an easy to access location. Others were um, uh, blessed, shall we say, with uh, uh, an abundance of certain resources that they could, uh, could trade for. Um, but in any event, these cities would become uh, centers uh, for trade, commercial centers. And other people would want to go uh, travel to those cities in order to see what goods are available there. Um, as trade networks developed, trading partners began to manufacture goods specifically for sale in other places. So perhaps one city um, has an abundance of uh, minerals that they can produce bronze weapons uh, from. Uh, and maybe there's a, another city that doesn't have access to those minerals and uh, requires bronze weapons. Uh, so that first city might begin the practice of purposely manufacturing bronze weapons to sell to that other city because they know that city regularly doesn't have access to that themselves. These uh, cities along trade routes supplied merchant caravans uh, with uh, food and resources they needed, but also helped police trade routes. This is a key idea as well. We already talked about the, uh, the dangers involved in, in travel, whether it's uh, thieves uh, and armed groups or pirates, uh, storms and so on, um, that could uh, create risk. Um, these cities along trade routes would uh, police their local area. So um, a, a part of the trade route around uh, their region. Uh, and that was in their best interest to do because it helped protect the trade that they were benefiting from. So not only did they protect other merchants, uh, they were protecting their own interests in doing so. Uh, and trade routes were essentially the communications high, highways of the past. Uh, so what we mean by communication highways is that um, these trade routes didn't just serve as uh, a way of bringing goods from one place to another. Um, we also get the exchange of ideas, which is a very, very important thing uh, that uh, we've already mentioned in the past, but we'll look at other examples going forward. New inventions um, can be seen by people from very far away through trade, uh, and those uh, Inventions may be adopted elsewhere. We get new ideas, could be about governance, um, about relationships among people in, in society, um, religious ideas, anything like that. Uh, we also get artistic styles, right? So aesthetic value and, and uh, what people find uh, pleasurable and beautiful, uh, which could help improve, uh, improve life. Uh, but we also get an exchange of languages uh, one person or group learning languages of another, uh, and also their social customs. Okay, so we, uh, we see these things happening in addition to the exchange of goods and raw materials. Uh, so in some cases, that could lead to um, closer connections between uh, cities along these trade routes as they come to understand uh, more easily, more fully, the lifestyle of another uh, the people of another city, um, which could create a greater form, a greater degree of cooperation between these places. Uh, on the other side, maybe differences uh, between these groups might uh, lead to the potential for conflict. And that's it for 10.1 um, pre-modern economic innovation. Uh, we'll pause here now and take a look at uh, the activity 10.1 trade in ancient Rome.